This episode of Because Science Footnotes is sponsored by Bill and Melinda Gates, a science and evidence-based philanthropic powerhouse that does good work through their foundation all over the world. We're very happy to have them here. And speaking about good science, evidence-based advice, it's cold season which means the common cold is going around. There's over 200 different cold viruses that cause a common cold. And so people inevitably get the cold and then want to treat its symptoms. There is no cure for the common cold, but what most people will run to, at least the people that I see around workspaces and you know in health food culture, that kind of thing, will run to a packet like this. A packet full of vitamin C, not just full of vitamin C, but full of a mega dose of vitamin C, meaning that it has what does this have? 1600% your daily value, recommended daily value of vitamin C. Now science does not support the claim that mega dosing on something like vitamin C prevents getting the common cold. So when you see someone in your office going like, mm, I need to pop one of these sweet pack packs to make sure that I don't get the common cold, it's not really supported by evidence as far as we know it. Uh, but Kyle, uh, that means that all the money spent on this is possibly, you know, just kind of wasted. Yeah, unless the evidence backs it up, what you are doing in effect is giving your body a lot of vitamin C to pee out. Anything above 100% of your recommended daily value is excreted by your body. <laughs> Overdosing on vitamin C? More like creating expensive pee. <laughs> Welcome to another edition of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all of your comments, questions, and corrections and address them on my Microsoft computer. And then I tell you what's coming up next on the Because Science channel. Hint! Oh, how about that for special effects, Stan Winston? But getting right down to it, on the last episode of Because Science, I said, and I made the very bold claim, that Link from the Legend of Zelda series is stronger than most superheroes. I made that claim based on a few feats that you can find in the games throughout the decades, where Link is displaying arguably super heroic strength that puts him not just on the level of characters like Captain America and Spider-Man and Bane, but beyond them. Ooh, but what did you have to say? I don't know why I'm whispering. Science with Seth says it takes a strong link to throw a pillar over his head, but an even stronger one to resist tormenting roosters in every age. You know, they say that psychopaths start out by harming small animals. <laughs> I don't know why I thought that. Also, this, based on the lifting capacity of a chicken, they can't really fly, so they could probably lift a little bit less than their own body weight, so it would take around, if we're being generous, maybe two dozen chickens to lift Link like it does in Ocarina of Time. Stephanie Brown says, hey, uh, you. <laughs> Stephanie Brown says, Kyle, you didn't even mention things like the iron boots. Lift, lift can link those, damn. Link can lift those to walk even underwater. That's true, I didn't mention anything about Link's iron boots, and that's because I don't think they are all that heavy. If you go back to the first iteration of the iron boots, which appears in Ocarina of Time, you can see that the iron boots let Link sink when he is floating on the surface of the water. So if you throw him into the water of something, say, like, the water temple, and then you put the iron boots on, you'll see that it cancels out some of his buoyancy. Link floats, but floats at a uh, level that's about his shoulders. Now, if the iron boots cancel out the amount of buoyancy that the body submerged without any of his head above his shoulders, uh, then you get a weight for the iron boots that's around 33 pounds. I can lift 33 pounds. Not so bad. Ellie Rick says that Link must also have superhuman durability to go along with his super strength, and it's shared to varying degrees among his many reincarnations and iterations. Many Links can fall from great heights and not break their legs from falls that should surely break those legs. And I want to focus on this part of the comment because there's an interesting part of this. Again, in Ocarina of Time, probably my favorite Zelda game, in Ocarina of Time, there's a Deku, or Deku, if you're nasty, shrub, that tells you if you jump uh, off a tall ledge and you roll at the bottom, when you land, you will suffer no fall damage. And this is actually physically 
and mathematically sound advice. So when you land and then continue on into a roll, you're allowing your body more time to come to a stop. And if you increase the amount of time your body takes to slow down its speed, you're lessening the forces on your body. That's why parkour dudes and dudettes roll at the bottom of their landings. And that's also why you don't want to do a superhero landing because that stops you almost immediately, whereas rolling increases the amount of time. So Link rolling after he dropped from a great height is accurate. You don't have to be a superhuman to roll. I've seen parkour dudes and dudettes jump from like 40 feet and then roll and they're fine. That's silly. They're silly and your pants are too baggy. Your feet are gonna get caught. <laughs> Anton Tor says Link isn't just strong, he has such awesome stamina in Breath of the Wild. I totally agree. In Breath of the Wild, you can use stamina to sprint, but you can also use it to climb up rock faces. Now, if you know me, you know I'm something of a rock climber myself, and uh, the amount of stamina you need to just go up to a rock face and start climbing it is enormous, especially if it has uh, no holds marked on it, no bolts bolted into it, and you can't use a rope, so you're free soloing this thing. Uh, it takes an immense amount of strength, and I think Breath of the Wild is the only game to implement like real stamina into climbing like no other video game does. The stuff that uh, Nathan Drake does, like jumping 20 feet to a ledge and then just grabbing it with your fingertips, I've never seen anyone come close to doing anything like that. And I've been climbing since I was 18. And I'm immortal now and angry about it. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving to one-time super nerd already, Ninja Bear Films and frequent commenter who says, so when I told my son Nate, uh, who's 10 years old, you were doing Link's Strength, he got super excited and wanted to do an experiment for it. So what Nate and his dad did, Ninja Bear Films, was go through footage from Zelda games and calculate the fall time and fall distance for Link in these various games, and they came up with something really interesting. Compared to Earth's gravity, in Skyward Sword, the world has a surface gravity of 0.97 Gs, and in Breath of the Wild, it has 1.71 Gs. Now, to put that into perspective, 1.71 Gs means that the Breath of the Wild world, whatever it is, has more surface gravity than any planet in the solar system aside from Jupe Jupe, and you can't really stand on the surface of Jupiter. I call it something different sometimes. And for going through all of those calculations by yourself with your son, which I think is a wonderful activity and it, it, it humbles me greatly that you do that with this show, uh, I am giving this super nerd to Nate and not your dad, Nate, because he's already won. So Nate, you are a super nerd. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> But of course, I'm not always right. Do you know what is always right, though? Microsoft Excel. <laughs> what a program. Our first correction comes from Zachary Miller, who says, Kyle, if Link was lifting the pillar in Ocarina of Time, wouldn't the granite slab crumble? I don't know the tensile strength of granite, but I know that it can easily fracture under way less than 18 million newtons of force. I agree, and if you watch this video called Il Capo, which is really, really fascinating and beautifully shot, it shows a guy directing heavy machinery to cleave sections of marble away from a quarry. And as you can see in the footage, you can just crack a huge section of marble, like almost the size of the pillar in Ocarina of Time, with just a backhoe. And this isn't rocket launch levels of force. So, Yes, you're probably right. The granite could be dealt some damage in the form of a pillar, especially during the throw part. That's when the forces would be the highest. But in this case, for Link's strength, uh, a lot of these corrections, my answers for them, are going to go back to we were just considering the strength part. Flo Sheesh says, wouldn't Link sink into the floor given the small surface area of his feet and the enormous weight that he can lift? Yes, we were just considering the strength part. LR Bearclaw says, Kyle, I am thrilled you did this. <laughs> However, I think that the pillar is not black granite, but rather black marble. And then he goes on to offer some different densities, and therefore it would be even heavier than what we considered. But sir, good sir, black marble actually has a density that is well within the ranges that we use. It's almost the exact same density, 2.6 to 2.8 grams per cubic centimeter, and I use 2.7, so it's basically the same. My point through all of this is that even if this pillar was made out of foam, it would be ridiculous for a human to do. 
the fact that it's made out of granite or rock or marble or what have you just puts Link in the realm of superhero. But this is just he way heavier than anything a human can lift by themselves. The most consistent correction, though, comes from a number of people like Amura here, Bob Smith, Ian Flynn, who all take issue with me saying that Link is as strong because he is using the Golden Gauntlets. And the example that I chose was when Link was lifting something with the Golden Gauntlets, and so you all claim that the Golden Gauntlets are doing the work, and so you can't really consider Link that strong. When I brought up Tony Stark as an example, you all said that he's super smart, and which he is, and that's a part of him, and so when he made the suit, it's still him because it's his smarts. I, I challenge this, I, I challenge this. How many superheroes can you think of off the top of your head that get their superpowers uh, from something that has nothing to do with them, like their innate abilities? Captain America gets a super soldier serum. He didn't make that, he just gets buff. Uh, Bane gets venom. Spider-Man gets accidentally bitten by a spider. It doesn't make him innately strong, uh, like you may be claiming. Uh, even Thor. Without this bad boy, yes, Thor is still superhumanly strong, but with Thor's hammer, with Mjolnir, he is so much stronger, so much more powerful, so much more able to do the things that we see him do. He can't fly without this. Would you say that Thor is not really as strong as he is because he has this? Eh. Even though Link uses a tool in the form of the Golden Gauntlets, he is a hero who fights evil with something that he definitely earned the right to use. And if that doesn't put him in the realm of superheroes, uh, Green Lantern gets a ring. That's maybe the best example. But the nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving to Toasty Lee, who says, I think you're also missing out on a non-strength superpower that Link has that could be used to significantly higher effect. Throughout the Legend of Zelda games, he picks up currency in the form of rupees, each of which are valued differently depending on color. Given his ability to store many hundreds of rupees, each of which appears to be several inches tall, and his, seemingly ab and his seeming ability to convert any and all rupees into any other rupee as required, this could imply an ability to perform mass energy conversion where he stores all these large bulky gems as a form of compressed energy and then reconstitutes them as whatever denomination he wishes at any time he decides to spend them. <laughs> That's weird. I love this for its nerdiness and also rupee physics is weird. What about that banker in Majora's Mask who can store and count your rupees through time? Sure, I'll store all your money for you, and if you show up in the past, I'll still be there with the amount of money you earned in the future. That is very, very weird. <laughs> and what is a rupee anyway? I, I would say it's just a mechanic that game designers use to approximate commercial value of things and serve as uh, something for the player to do. But also, what if they're crazy time vortexes? Half-Life reconfirmed? <laughs> what? Oh. <wh> <laughs> So Toasty Lee, for making me think about rupee physics, you are indeed a super nerd. Sorry, I froze. <laughs> I couldn't think of anything on the spot. This is the size of the, of the super nerd rupee that you get. Now, if you are already subscribed to Alpha, which you can do at projectalpha.com, you already know what the next episode of Because Science is going to be because you saw it two days earlier than anyone else. Just ignore one of those. But if you haven't subscribed to Alpha just yet, the next episode of Because Science is How to Fight Wolverine with Science, bub. That's right. In this week's episode of Because Science, kind of like we did in How to Fight a T-Rex, How to Fight a Velociraptor, we are using Wolverine and everything we know about his mutant powers and how they work to come up with some sciency and more realistic ways to fight Logan and to best the beast. Some of them we've talked about before, but others I think are a legitimate way to uh, fight. So, go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet, all about Link and how strong that little boy be, and leave me your best, com mm? best comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. Them, the handles. And thank you, of course, again to Bill and Melinda Gates for sponsoring today's episode of Because Science Footnotes, which reminds me, don't forget, we need to be very clear on what the problems and challenges are with regards to climate change if we're ever going to really seriously tackle the greatest problem of our time. 
I was reading the annual letter from Bill and Melinda Gates, and you can see it here. They do amazing work. They advance women's education in developing countries. They advance vaccines. Uh, they support green technology. They're great. And reading their letter, they list some things that surprised them about the previous year, and something actually in it surprised me very much, and it kind of scared me. The amount of building that the world is projected to do by the year 2060, building homes and factories and cities, is equivalent to building an entire New York City every single month from now until 2060. Think about that for a second. The entire infrastructure of New York City going up somewhere in the world every single month for the next over 40 years. This kind of development is an enormous driver of climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. It's not just farting cows and emissions from cars. We have to also consider how we are building up and out in the world. If we are ever going to solve climate change, we all have to be very clear and very aware of all of the challenges, how to address them, and we have to hit them simultaneously and very hard. We have to basically start pulling the emergency brake. The planet is not going to save itself. I mean, the planet will be fine. We won't. If you want to read more about this and all the interesting world trends that surprised Bill and Melinda Gates uh, in their annual letter, you can read that letter by going to the link down in our show's description, or you can go to GatesNotes.com.